now let's join Pastor Holland live at Calvary Chapel in is, uh, is an interesting letter because unlike Paul's other letters, um, Philemon is actually written to a person. It's a personal letter. Um, the other letters that Paul did were written to churches, but this one is written to an individual. And so it begs the question, what makes Philemon so special? You know, why would Paul write a letter specifically to Philemon? And so we have to know a little bit about Philemon. Philemon was a wealthy man uh, who lived in Colossae. And he had a home. Uh, we know he was wealthy because he had a home that was large enough to host the church uh, that met in Colossae. And, and he also had a guest room because Paul says, get your guest room ready. I'm going to be coming and visiting you. So he had a, a large enough home to host a, a group of people and he had a guest room. He also had several slaves. And so in order to have a slave, you had to afford to be able to take care of a slave. And so he had several slaves, one of which was named Onesimus. We also know that Philemon was a convert of Paul's ministry. And so most likely Philemon met Paul uh, as he was on his kind of his business uh, journeys, if you will, on his business trips uh, when he would go to Ephesus and Paul was there um, preaching that Paul probably, you know, encountered Philemon or Philemon encountered some converts of Paul. And he comes to Christ as a result of Paul's ministry. Paul describes him as one of his fellow workers and a partner in the ministry. And oftentimes God will use businessmen to support ministries and when we were working with promise keepers that was something we often saw biz whole corporations businesses um uh, people don't know this but um oh what was one of the real wealthy families in the 1900 turn around the 40s um the, no it wasn't the rothschilds they were an american family no it wasn't hearst keep Rock, was it Rockefeller? Maybe it was Rockefeller. I don't know. But um, basically what he did was he, he was responsible for starting and funding the American Missions Board. He had a heart for missions. He couldn't go on missions himself. And so uh, once God blessed his company, he took all of his, uh, his, the money that he made and he invested it in the American Missions Board and planted churches all over the world. Um, John Deere uh, lives on 10% of his income, you know, John Deere tractor, and he gives 90% of it away uh, to fund ministries and, and, and all, all around the world. And so God uses wealthy businessmen to support ministries. The fact that a letter was written to Philemon suggests really that he was probably the leader of the church that met at his home. His experience and wisdom in business was invaluable to this new church. And thus Philemon gives us a picture of how God uses natural gifts and abilities for supernatural purposes. One other thing to mention is that Ignatius mentions a man by the name of Onesimus, who becomes the bishop of Ephesus. Ignatius was one of the early church fathers and historian. And it's possible that Onesimus of Philemon would become a future leader of the early church. And Paul is seeing the potential in this young man that uh, is in, has this problem with Philemon, and thus he's interceding on behalf of someone that he sees with great potential. At the same time, Paul is defending the reputation of Philemon because the departure of Onesimus could suggest to some that Philemon was a cruel master. Oh, there's problems with Philemon. Onesimus ran away. It must be, you know, Philemon's a bad guy. And so Paul is interceding on behalf of Philemon to help restore his uh, reputation. Now, with regards to slavery, in the, in the Civil War and then later in the 60s revisited with Martin Luther King restoring uh, rights to uh, African Americans, we see that battle continuing with uh, Latinos and with uh, people from Asia 
uh, from the Asians that are coming in, where they're seen as different from the culture. And so the gospel puts everyone on equal footing. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. There is no Greek, there is no Jew, there's no difference. We're all the same when it comes to Jesus. At this time, Paul is in a Roman prison. But notice he doesn't say, I'm a prisoner of the Rome, or um, sorry, let me go back and we'll start reading with verse 1. I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 1 says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved uh, Apphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Paul begins by identifying himself with Onesimus. Notice he doesn't come in and say, hey, I am Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, identifying himself with Onesimus. Onesimus is a prisoner to slavery, and Paul is a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Onesimus has no rights of his own. Paul is saying, I have no rights of my own. I'm a slave to Christ. You know, grace identifies with those who are marginalized by society. But it doesn't identify with their fallenness. It doesn't identify with their fallen nature. Rather, it identifies with God's created intent for man. It finds the least, the last, the lost, the lonely, the forgotten ones. And it comes alongside of them and it elevates them and gives them worth and value. God created man to live in freedom, not to be enslaved to other men. Now, at this time, Paul is in a Roman prison. But notice, he doesn't say that I'm a prisoner of the Roman government. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know, if he was to see himself as a prisoner of Rome, he could sit in his cell and have a pity party. You know, oh, if, if Jesus would just deliver me out of my bonds, you know, but here I am stuck, and, and he would just be complaining. But if you're a prisoner of Jesus Christ, then the only appropriate response is to rejoice. Because I'm not bound to this prison cell by chains. I'm bound by my love for Jesus Christ. You know, and so it is with everything that we find that comes into our life that seems to overwhelm us or to seems to take, you know, to kind of put us in, in bondage or put us in a place of constriction. We're not prisoners to those situations we're not enslaved to our circumstances we're prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ and so it doesn't matter what circumstance I find myself in I can rejoice because I belong to Jesus and he's the one that is leading me he's the one that's directing me he's the one that's taking care of me even in the midst of my circumstances and if you can have that kind of an attitude you'll be bomb proof what I call bomb-proof, immovable. Nothing will be able to move you. Nothing will be able to get to you. Paul also includes Timothy because Timothy is in Rome with Paul. So the writing of Philemon is prior to Paul's letter to Timothy in Ephesus. He's writing to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. And so Philemon was a key person in Paul's ministry. He's also writing to Aphia, who, whom scholars believe is Philemon's wife. You know, and so he's writing to the husband and wife together. He also mentions Archippus, our fellow soldier. Our fellow soldier. Archippus is mentioned in Colossians 4.17, where Paul encourages him to fulfill the ministry he received from the Lord. And so here at Colossae, Archippus is fulfilling his ministry. And finally, Paul is writing to the church in the house of Philemon. You know, during the first Jesus movement, I'm talking about the book of Acts. You know, not the Jesus movement that we're aware of. But, but the first Jesus movement, there weren't any church buildings. They didn't have a church to go to. There were the synagogues, and they weren't allowed to meet in the synagogues, especially with Gentiles. So they had to meet in homes 
And they had to find a home that was big enough to accommodate the number of people. So they often would meet in the homes of wealthy people. The first Christian church was uh, built, is found in Jordan, and it was built in 230 A.D. So for the first 230 years of the church, there was no church building. You know, it's just something for us to keep in mind. They couldn't worship in the synagogue, so they worshiped in houses. Paul mentions the church that was in the home of Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus. Uh, when Aquila and Priscilla moved to Rome, Paul addresses the church in the home of Aquila and Priscilla in the book of Romans. You know, And so you had this couple that would go around, and wherever they went, they opened their home and began having Bible studies and began to um, planting churches You know, wherever they found themselves. In verse 4, uh, we read, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. You know, Paul had a tremendous prayer life. We said that often as we're looking at uh, the letters of Paul. Always praying for the churches he was involved with, even the ones that he didn't even plant, but somehow he heard about them or he was, you know, somehow knew someone that was involved in planting a church. And he prayed for them as well. And it's a great reminder for us, really, to pray for our church, to pray for Calvary Chapel, you know, and pray for the churches that we're in relationship with. You know, we, I have a, a list that I'm praying for on a daily basis that includes all the churches in San Clemente that we work with on a regular basis, just praying for them and asking God to bless them. In verse 5, hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. And so Paul thanks God because he is hearing of their love and faith. The tense of the word hearing is in the, is in the present tense, which means that Paul is hearing good reports about Philemon. Isn't it good when people hear good things about you? No, I hear good things, that people will tell me that. I hear great things are happening in, with Calvary Chapel in San Clemente. And they're always excited about what the Lord is doing here. He's hearing about Philemon's love and faithfulness to the Lord and to all the saints, you know, referring to everyone that he's, uh, that he's ministering to in his house church. Verse 6 here, where he says that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, Christ Jesus, is really related to verse 4, where he says, uh, I'm making mention of you always in my prayer. Pray, Paul is praying that they would become effective in sharing their faith to others. So that's one of the prayers that Paul is praying. You know, And I would encourage you to pray that prayer for each other. Pray that prayer for our church. That we would become effective in sharing our faith with others. Now, what does it mean to share your faith? What is Paul talking about there? Well, it simply means to share the good things that you have received in Christ Jesus. Just share the good things that God has done. What have you received? A healed body? A restored marriage? Hope? Peace? Abundant life, a confident future. You know, those are the obvious things we think about when we think about things we've received. But there's also good things that go beyond what we could ever think or imagine. That abundant, spirit-filled life. The abundant life that we have in Christ Jesus. How can you not want to tell someone about that? You know, the, the ability to be led by the Spirit and have God direct your life and guide you. I mean, how, how could you not talk about that? The power of the Holy Spirit. That's such a, an exciting thing to talk about. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, prayed that they might have the spirit of wisdom and understanding to know the hope of their calling, to know what God has provided for them in Christ Jesus. You know, the greatest tragedy of all is to see a Christian who is living beneath what God has provided they're overwhelmed by life when God has provided the Holy Spirit to give us the power to live. They're overwhelmed by depression and anxiety when God has provided joy unspeakable and full of glory. And for many of us, it's 
it's really just learning to depend upon Jesus and go to him first instead of trying to deal with life on your own trying to deal with life in your own power and in your own strength we weren't designed to do that that's why every time we try to do it we fail you know we get filled with anxiety we get depressed because we weren't designed God didn't make us for that God designed us for us to have fellowship with him and to bring it all to him in prayer and to leave it at his feet, allow him to carry the weight. Second Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. God has given us all things. The problem is we don't always know what is available or we don't use what is available for us. That's why it's so essential to study the word of God. Not just, you know, coming to church on Thursdays and, or coming to church on Sunday mornings and going through the scriptures with us. But on your own, to be in the word of God so that you know what God has provided for you. You know what's available to you. You know what you don't have to put up with. You know, so often I'll talk to people and they're overwhelmed by this situ situation. They're just overrun by the enemy. And, and I'll ask them, why are you letting that happen? Oh, I'm not letting it happen. It's just happening to me. He says, no, it's not. You're letting it happen. Because God has given you all authority. You don't have to put up with that. I don't? No, you don't. I went through a, a very long trial. It was about two or three years. And I was suffered from anxiety and depression. And... Uh, and I remember, you know, and this guy, you know, came to me and says, take calcium lactate. That'll, your, your problem is your myelin sheath is all frayed. You have frayed nerves. You got to take calcium lactate, build it up, giving me all this stuff to do. And so I was trying everything. And I remember praying one day and, uh, and I was just like, Lord, how long is this going to be? This is so hard. This is a hard trial. And and uh, the Lord says, well, how long do you want it to go on for? When do you want it to end? I says, I want it to end tomorrow or right now. And he goes, well, you can end it. This isn't me. You did this to yourself. And I said, really? I can end it? I want, I want to end it right now. He goes, okay, it's done. You just stop doing what you're doing. Do what I tell you to do, and it'll be over and you know what? It was over the next day. My depression was gone. My anxiety, it all went. I put up with something because I didn't know what was available to me until I read it in God's word. So Paul is praying that Philemon would know all of the riches of God's grace that are available to him in Christ Jesus, that he might be effective in sharing all of these good things that God has given to us through Jesus. In verse 7, For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Now the word for heart is literally the word bowels. You know, your stomach. And uh, the word bowels is used because that's where you feel the deepest emotion. You feel it in your gut, right? You feel it in your stomach. Where do you get the butterflies when you're on your first date with someone? In your stomach, you know? You don't get it in your heart. And so, um, and so that's what the word literally is. And so, of course, today we describe deep emotions as coming from the heart. And so modern translations no longer translate this word bowels. If you go to the King James, it says bowels. But instead, they translate it heart. And so Paul is saying to Philemon, we're overjoyed because you've refreshed the saints in Colossae. Most likely using the resources God has provided to him to bless them with. You know, over the years there have been times when God has blessed us with resources and what a joy it is to use what God has provided to be a blessing to others, you know. In verse 8, therefore... Though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting because Paul is an apostle. Paul did have uh, a lot of authority in the church of Colossae, 
And he, he, it, that position of authority was not something that he appointed himself to. He wasn't a self-declared pastor. He wasn't a self-declared apostle. It was something that God called him to. It was given to him by God. He was also instrumental in leading Philemon to Christ, as well as establishing the church that met in his home. And so it would have been right, it would have been proper for him to tell Philemon what to do. It would have been absolutely appropriate for Paul to say, listen Philemon, I'm going to tell you as your apostle, as your pastor, we don't use a apostle, that's weird. Um, as your pastor, I'm going to tell you what you need to do in this circumstance. He could have exercised his position of authority over the church and over Philemon. Yet Paul chose not to use it. He says, yet for love's sake, I appeal to you. Jesus said the Gentiles or the heathen love to exercise authority, but not you. Whoever wants to be great, let him be the servant of all. Now, tragically, there are churches that where the leadership loves to exercise authority over people. They love to tell people how to live their lives. I know of a very popular church in South Orange County that would actually serve divorce papers to people during their counseling sessions. You know, if, um, if they believe the husband was not living up to their responsibilities as the head of the home, um, they would convince the wife that he was an unbeliever and influence her to divorce the husband. And so one day the husband would come in for their marriage counseling session and, and the wife wouldn't be there. They would, they would take her and put her away and he wouldn't be able to find her and they would serve him divorce papers. You know, lording it over, telling people how to live their lives. A while back there was the shepherding movement. You know, where they would say, I'm your pastor, I'm your shepherd, and you have to run everything by me before you make a decision and make sure it's a godly decision. And, and um, you couldn't buy a home, you couldn't go out with someone unless they first met, you know, your shepherd and they got the approval uh, of your shepherd. And so Paul is saying, you know, I do have the right to order you what to do, yet for love's sake, I would rather ask you. After all, I'm just Paul, I'm just an old man. You know, I'm just a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'm no better than you. I'm not a prisoner of Rome, but a prisoner of Christ. And so in verse 10, it says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. In Colossians 4, Paul refers to Onesimus as a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, meaning that he was originally from Colossae. And so it's believed that uh, uh, Tychicus delivered the letter of Paul to the Colossians, and when he returned back to Rome, he brought Onesimus back with him to meet Paul. Paul refers to him as his son, meaning he was a son in the faith. Paul led him to Christ. Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy. He was a spiritual father to Titus. And now he's a spiritual father to Onesimus. And they would come to Paul to ask for advice and to get godly counsel. And so most likely Onesimus comes to Paul for help concerning the problem he's having with Philemon. And Paul is now interceding for him. He's now kind of going to bat for him. Paul refers to Onesimus as a profitable servant. A servant. Onesimus actually means profitable. But he acknowledges that he was unprofitable for Philemon. So whatever happened, Onesimus was not doing a good job for Philemon. And, uh, and it was causing problems. But Paul is informing Philemon that something's changed. A change has happened in Onesimus' life. The old slave that was unprofitable for you has had a change of character. He's been born again. He's a new creation in Christ. And now he's profitable for you 
and for me. He's profitable for both of us. You know, this is the change that the gospel can make in a person's life. Those who were useless, rebellious, can become valuable and productive. I mean, look at Mike McIntosh. He's my friend, I can say that. You know, but there was a time when he believed that his brain was on the outside of his head. And he would walk around and walk up to people and say, hey, can you see my brain hanging out of my head right now? He was so wasted from drugs. And yet God has used him. You know, he became born again and God used him mightily to lead countless thousands of people to Christ. We're seeing in our culture the desire to judge a man's character based on what they did before they came to Christ, based on things that happened years and years ago. However, in Christ, we are all new creations. The old is past, the new has come, and is coming consistently every day. And when it says the old is past, the new has come, it means that it has come, and it's coming. It is, it is, it is here, and it's continuing to come. It gets better from here. It doesn't get worse, it gets better. And so Paul is saying, whoever Onesimus was in the past, he's a changed man. You need to give him another chance. And you know what? I have that philosophy for everybody. I never write anybody out. I never, you know, check the box and write someone off. Because God can do a work in someone's life to change them. God can restore and, and do a, a phenomenal work. And, and it's really a work of his spirit. And so who am I to judge? Who am I to say that? That person is disqualified. God may requalify him. In verse 12, I am sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. Now we're not really told what the problem was between Philemon and Onesimus. Um, some have suggested that the slaves of that region, you know, just the quality of people of that region, they were known for being useless. You know, they were lazy and not really good servants, not really good slaves. And so some believe that that was Onesimus. He was just like everyone else. He lived up to that reputation. Others have speculated that Onesimus was a runaway slave, which in Rome was a crime that was punishable. You know, it was, it was bad to be a runaway slave. Um, you know, they could be branded, they could be burnt, uh, they could be maimed, you know, so they can run away again, or they could be uh, executed. Regardless, Paul is asking Philemon to take Onesimus back as he would Paul. Treat him like you would me. Treat him like a guest of honor, like you would treat me. Now that's a, re a, a radical statement because you didn't treat slaves like everyone else. You didn't treat slaves like uh, regular people. They were slaves. They were your property. You, you just told them what to do and they did it. And if they didn't do what you wanted them to do, then you punished them. You know, it's what, it's what you would do to slaves. But now that he's in Christ, Paul is saying, no longer treat him as a slave. He's not that anymore. He's so much more. Paul goes on to say, I wanted to keep him with me, but he belongs to you. And the only way that I would keep him here to minister to me is if it was with your consent. If you had sent him to me and said, Paul, I want him to serve you and to take care of you as a blessing to you. Don't worry about it. I'm paying for it. It's, it's all on me. I just want him to bless you. Then, yeah, I would keep him here. But he's not, he's not here because of that. You know, I know he's not here because of that. Something happened. And so I want you to, uh, so I, I'm not, I want you to know that I'm not keeping him here against your will. I mean, look at how gracious Paul is in dealing with Philemon. You know, I have the power to make him stay with me, but I want to give you the opportunity to do what's right, to do what's loving, to help me out of a willing heart. You know, our service to the Lord should always come from a willing heart. It should always come 
from a heart that simply wants to do it out of love for God and love for others. That's why we do what we do. We don't do it to get ahead or, you know, to, you know, become more popular or more loved or to have our own gig or our own, our own thing, our own kingdom, whatever. We do it out of love for Jesus and love for people. It should never be forced, not out of compulsion, but voluntary. Now, I will say this. If you are going to do things for the Lord, be faithful. You know, do them as unto the Lord. You know, I've had people that will, you know, volunteer for things. And I had one lady that came to me one day and she says, God has called me to be your assistant, your personal assistant. And I says, oh, great. And I never saw her again. She like disappeared. You know, it was so it was such such a wild thing. I thought, wow, I, what did I do? I, there wasn't enough to do anything. You know, I just said, great. And then I never saw her again. And I've had others that have come and volunteered and then, you know, start something and quit something, you know, mid midstream, not really follow through. And, and, um, and then they'll call me and apologize and I'll say, no problem. Because they're not doing it for me. They're doing it as unto the Lord. And so they have to answer to the Lord, not to me. You know, it's unto Jesus that we serve. And so I believe if everyone was, was obedient to the Spirit's leading and faithful to do what Jesus commands them to do, then everything that needs to get done would get done. Because God has provided everyone that he needs to get things done. And, um, and also, if we just would listen to the voice of the Spirit, we would find ourselves not in situations that were not not equipped to handle or to do. You know, God would lead us into things that we could actually complete because he's leading us and we're following his, uh, his command. And so I leave it with the Lord. You know, I trust the Lord. God brings the help. God knows what we need done. And God provides the people to do it and the resources. In verse 15, For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave. A beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now this is a, an interesting perspective. And probably one of the most powerful statements in the letter of Philemon. Paul says, perhaps he, de he departed for a while which means Onesimus was gone for some time. We don't know how much time. But notice Paul gives the eternal perspective that you might receive him forever. No longer as a slave, but as a beloved brother. Now to me, this speaks of how God uses adverse circumstances in our life to work out his eternal purposes. That God sometimes uses things that we don't understand because he has a different perspective than we do. What appears to be a tragedy to me is actually God at work. And the reality that I have to live with is I'm a creature of time. That's my problem. That's our problem. I'm a creature of time. I exist in time in space. I was born into a timeline. I had a birth date and someday I'm going to have a finish date. And God knows when that is. And in between those two dates is a line. And I can I can see what happened behind me, but I can't see what's going to happen in front of me. I don't have that kind of knowledge. I don't have that kind of perspective. And so I can't always see God's eternal plan. I can't always see what God is doing 
day by day. You know, history is his story. And my history is his story as it works out in my life. And so I can only see the part of the story that I'm living in right now. That's all I can see. I can't see what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day or the next week or the next month or the next year. And if I'm in a bad part of the story, then I'll often judge my future based on my present circumstance. And I'll make decisions and I'll make judgments based on the limited knowledge of the time that I'm in right now. But as you know from watching TV, things change as the story goes on. You know, in 60 minutes, you can see the whole world come to the verge of collapse. And in the last five minutes, everything gets fixed and the whole world is saved and it's all okay. You know, we know that things don't stay the way they are. Now, the beautiful thing about the story that we're living in is we know how it turns out in the end. You know, they all lived happily ever after. We have a great ending to our story. But right now, it may not be good. Right now, it may be difficult. But here's the thing, God is working. Even in the midst of our difficulties. God is working all things together for good to those who are called according to His purpose. And it's not just a glib statement. It's a reality. It's a truth. And you cannot see it because you don't have the perspective of God. As God said to Job, you know, as Job was going back and forth, Job, Job at, God at the end finally tells Job, look, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? You know, where were you when I set the world in motion? And you're going to try and tell me what's up? Even if I tried to tell you, you wouldn't understand it. That's why it requires faith. We have to trust the Lord. We have to trust in what God is doing, the plan that God is working in our lives. When you're going through difficult times, you can't rely on what you see or what you know or what you understand. You have to rely on what God says in His Word and the strength of His character. You have to trust in the Lord because He's the only one that ultimately knows. Going to a counselor isn't going to help. Counselor is just going to tell you, you know, how to manage your feelings as you're going through things. When what you need are not managed feelings, what you need are answers. And the only person that has the answer is God himself. He's the one that we go to. And so Philemon, you lost him for a while. But while he was gone, God was working. Maybe God's plan all along was to bring him back to you, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. That's the plan that God was working. In verse 17, If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay. I mean, this is, that's like me telling Trump, right? I'll pay the bill. Trump would probably let me pay the bill. Not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have the joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. You know, Paul puts his own reputation on the line for Onesimus. If you count me as a partner, if you respect me, then receive him. I've watched Pastor Chuck put his reputation on the line for people. And he took a lot of heat for doing it. And it didn't always work out. But he would often say, I would rather err on the side of grace. Because one day I might need it from you. 
But Paul goes even further. He says, if Onesimus has wronged you, or if he owes you anything, charge it to me. I'll pay for it. Now that's a true intercessor. Taking upon himself Onesimus' debt. I'm going to take it on myself. I'm going to relieve Onesimus of this debt. And that's what Jesus did for us. He took upon himself our debt. He didn't have to do it. But he went to the Father and he says, Hey, these guys owe you anything. I'll pay for it. They don't have to pay for it. Paul is so serious about removing any question about Onesimus' conversion that he says, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will repay. Here's my signature. I'm signing this. Paul, I will pay the bill. That's how convinced he is. But then Paul brings up the subject that Philemon probably doesn't want to hear. Don't forget, Philemon, that if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be here either. If it wasn't for me, Philemon, you wouldn't be a follower of Jesus Christ because I'm the one that led you to Christ. And now, Onesimus is receiving the same ministry that you receive. The same grace that you received, I'm wanting to give that to Onesimus. And so Philemon, would you trust me with this? Would you receive him as you would me? Look how blessed your life is, Philemon, because of the gospel. Don't you want that for him? And then Paul appeals to his character. Philemon, you've refreshed the hearts of the saints. Why not refresh my heart in the Lord? You want to refresh my heart? You want to minister to me, Philemon? Then receive Onesimus back into your home. Let me see, have the joy of seeing the two of you together again, of hearing the story of how God reconciled the two of you, of hearing the testimony of total forgiveness. Oh, that would just refresh my heart, Philemon. Let me have the joy of that. In verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Now, this is a bold way to close your argument. Philemon, I know you'll do it. Because I know what kind of person you are. Knowing the grace and love that you have for people, I know that you'll do what I've asked you to do. Verse 22, But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Prepare me a room, because I trust that God will answer your prayers. You know, Paul's in prison. Philemon's praying that Paul will get out of prison. And so Paul say, hey, I believe God's going to hear you. So get ready for me to come. And so this brings up an interesting issue concerning the power of prayer and the sovereignty of God. You know, if God is sovereign and only does what he is going to do, God is in control of everything. Nothing happens without God. Then why do I need to pray? If God's going to do it, why should I pray? If God's going to save people, whether we like it or not, why should I witness? God's going to do it. He's sovereign. He's in control of everything. He's going to do it. Well, if that's true, then we don't need to pray. It's redundant. It's not needed. But we pray because the scripture commands us to pray. And the scripture commands us to pray because God answers prayer. Our prayers can change the actions of God. Our prayers influence God. Prayer is more than asking God for things. Prayer is communion with God, worshiping God, expressing your heart, your love, your thanksgiving to God. And most of the time, we don't pray until we're in trouble, and then we ask God to do something. And when He doesn't do something, we call it sovereignty. Oh, that's the will of God. That's usually what people mean. 
when they say it's the will of God. It means that they prayed and God did something that they didn't want to see happen, that they were praying against, but it happened anyhow. Oh, well, God is sovereign. It's the will of God. Well, actually, that's not Christianity. That's Islam. Islam teaches that. It's kismet. Oh, it's the will of the God. We, we can't do anything about it. God's going to do whatever he wants to do. I knew a pastor that negotiated a bad business deal, was moving out from uh, the Midwest to, to here, to Southern California, and was uh, trying to get a job in the meantime. And uh, he, you know, was, you know, when he got out here, he found out that, that what he had negotiated wasn't what he thought, and the costs were more. And so he, he said, well, I guess God just wanted me to learn how to live on less money. And I said, God had nothing to do with this. You're a terrible negotiator. That's what it has to do with. You know, you need to learn how to negotiate better for your family. God wasn't even involved in the process. If you would have listened to God, he probably would have told you, you're a bad negotiator. You need to get help. And he would have probably taught you how to be a better negotiator. He's Jewish. He knows how to negotiate, right? And so when we're in that place of communion and resting and listening and thanking and not just meeting with God when we have needs, but spending that time with the Lord in, in prayer and cultivating that relationship where we're hearing Him and walking with Him and obeying Him, then, and He's directing our lives, then He'll show us everything we need. We don't have to worry about it. And how often do we settle for less because we haven't spent time in communion with God, allowing ourselves to be led by His Spirit? And rather what we do is we get in crisis and we shoot up rapid prayers hoping to change the outcome. And when it doesn't go well, we say, oh, well, God is sovereign. No. You're not listening to God. That's what the problem is. You're not hearing his voice. You're not walking with him. You're not spending that time in communion, daily communion, not asking him for things, just spending time with him because you love to be in his presence. Verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as do Mark, uh, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Epaphras is mentioned in Colossians, and Paul mentions him as a faithful minister in Christ. And here in Philemon, he's a fellow prisoner in Christ. So he was probably in prison with Paul in Rome. Uh, that's true prison fellowship right there. Uh, John Mark is the one that Paul and Barnabas had a falling out over. And now we see him with Paul. So something happened. You know, Paul and Barnabas, we don't ever see them reconnecting, but we see Paul and John Mark reconnecting. And so at some point, whatever, whatever was happening with John Mark was resolved with Paul, and now they're ministering together again. Aristarchus was from uh, uh, Thessalonica. Uh, if you remember, they grabbed him in Ephesus when the silversmith uh, Demetrius created a riot because they couldn't find Paul. And so they grabbed uh, Aristarchus and, and gave him the what for, you know, instead of giving it to Paul. We see here mentioned Demas. Demas later on would forsake Paul. Paul say, said that having loved the present world more than the things of God. And yet here he mentions him. So this is before... He departed from Paul. So in, a, in essence, Demas is on his way out here. Paul mentions Luke, the author of Acts, the Gospel of Luke. And if you see the movie Paul the Apostle, it's really about the, the final imprisonment of Paul where Luke is there and they're writing the book of Acts together. And then Paul closes with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He begins with grace and he closes with grace. And so Philemon is all about the grace of God being put in action. Where Jesus changes a life. And Paul is now interceding on behalf of that changed life and saying, hey, would you give him a second chance? And see what God has done. And now you'll find out that he's useful both to me and to you. 
And like it says, in the kingdom of God, until you are in a coffin, until the nail is nailed on, you know, shut, there's always hope. There's always an opportunity for God to work. There's always the ability for God to change a heart. There's always the ability for God to do a miracle and to bring restoration and reconciliation through forgiveness. Father, thank you for your word. And, and Lord, what an incredible uh, testimony of forgiveness. What an incredible testimony of restoration, Lord. And Lord, I pray for all of those relationships in our lives where um, we're asking you to restore and to reconcile. And Lord, we pray that you would do it. That what we can't see, what we perceive as a total loss, a total breakdown, a total... Um, a total catastrophe, Lord. You don't see it that way because you see the end from the beginning. And Lord, that we would learn to just simply trust in the work that you are doing. To trust that you are working behind the scenes, even though we don't see it. And to know, Lord, that your purpose is going to be fulfilled in our lives because you said that you would do it. The work that you began, you promised you would finish it. And so we can take that promise to the bank. We can know that that is a sure promise. You're going to accomplish everything that you said you would in our lives. You're going to give us the desires of our heart. And so, Lord, that we wouldn't count any circumstances over and out. Because we never know what you're going to do. So, Lord, bring us to that place of trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.